Well, hello, everybody. It's so good to see you. My name is Jason, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Great Hope Church in the beautiful city of Dayton, Ohio. And uh, I'm so glad that you've uh, chosen to worship with us today. We're in the midst of a series um, on the life of Esther and on the book of Esther. And one of the big themes that we see throughout the book, there's like one big idea throughout the whole book, and that is that, um, that God preserves his people, and he keeps his promises. It's, the, the, the book speaks much about resilience. It speaks much about, uh, about God being present among us even when he's silent. Uh, and, and ultimately, we see this theme running throughout the book, that no matter how bad and how difficult things seem, God always preserves his people, and he always keeps his promises. When we come to chapter 6, we begin to see a reversal of fortune, so to speak. A few weeks ago, I was uh, flipping through some channels, and I came across a movie that I had not seen in years, um, and and was watching it for a little bit. It's an absolutely hilarious movie. It it is the movie, I'm not sure if you've seen it, uh, it's called Trading Places. It's from 19, I believe, 1983, and it it features uh, Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. And the premise of the movie is, is there's these two uh, kind of old, crotchety um, uh, investment bankers. And, uh, and there is a young uh, man, na- young man played by Dan Aykroyd, that's uh, working for the firm. And uh, there's another character played by uh, Eddie Murphy that's kind of a street hustler. In fact, when we're introduced to Eddie Murphy uh, in the story... He is uh, he's pretending to be blind and lame in order to scam people out of money. Well, the um, the two older men, the two older men in that uh, the two crotchety old guys in the story, they they begin to place a bet, and the bet is this: is 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 Eddie Murphy's character uh, in that story, and Dan Aykroyd's kind of uh, snooty young uppity character in that story. Do they have the lives that they have because of the choices that they make and the intelligence that they have? Or are they just simply products of their circumstances or their environment? And so they make a little wager, and what they do is they they trade the places of the two men. Uh, Eddie Murphy is offered a job to work at the Wall Street firm, and uh, Dan Aykroyd is set up so that, he, um, so, so that he gets framed for a crime that he did not commit. And as you can imagine, Dan Aykroyd's life begins to spiral out of control. And Eddie Murphy is in a situation that his life has been changed overnight. Um, he, has, he has fortunes that he could never imagine, but uh, with that also comes New, ch- new problems and new challenges. The theme of the whole movie, which uh, you, can, you, can, you can imagine, is, is that so much of our environment determines who we are. But the lives of these two individuals are changed, they're traded, because someone that has the power to alter their life changes their lives by changing their, their, their places. These two old men have the control over these guys because they can orchestrate and coordinate through their power the circumstances in the lives of both Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. When we come to Esther chapter 6, we're reminded that the, the hand of God is seen throughout Esther, but the name of God is not. In fact, uh, Derek Prime uh, to paraphrase, para, paraphrase Prime, he, he says that God is never more evident and more silent than he is in the book of Esther. But God is orchestrating the events in chapter 6, primarily of two people that we were introduced in the previous chapter. You have Mordecai who has... Uh, he is the cousin of Queen Esther. Mordecai uh, works near the city gate. Mordecai uh, finds, uh, uncovers a, 
or overhears rather, a plan of assassination on the king. And he goes through Esther to inform the king of, of the plan. And then when it's time to be rewarded, he's forgotten about. At the same time, Haman is ascending quickly in the kingdom. Haman is now uh, second in command to the king, second in charge over the entire empire. And Haman has developed a plan in the previous chapter where he is going to um, ask the king today in the morning for the, ex for the permission to hang Mordecai on 75-foot gallows for all the city to see. Mordecai needs a, a role of reversal. He needs to trade places, and, and Haman cannot imagine trading places or reversing fortunes. But what we see in this passage is that God preserves his people and he keeps his promises. And he does so in three very, very unique ways. The first way that God is going to preserve his people and keep his promises is, is he is going to preserve the life of Mordecai in a very unexpected time. The passage begins by by reading, it says, On the night the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book, the memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read to the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told all that Bigthana and Terash, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who, and who sought to lay cans, hands on King Ashuerus. And the king said, What distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this, the king is suffering from a uh, a case of insomnia, and uh, I was actually reading today that the cure for insomnia is sleep. I'm not sure if you know that or not, but the cure for insom insomnia is sleep. If you just get some sleep, you can cure your insomnia. But the king is up; he can't sleep, and so what he does is he asks for the records to be read of what has happened. And uh, they read through these records. And these are basically, it's like reading the tax code. It's like reading the transcript of what you might see on C-SPAN. He's reading about uh, how, uh, how uh, places were taxed. He's reading about how, um, how uh, wars were won, how tributes were paid, how land was allotted, uh, who's in charge of what place. It's, it's, it's a rather dry document, except there's maybe a few historical things in it that are interesting. Some wars won, always, some wars won and um, uh, the bad stuff was eliminated out. What well, just so happens that he's reading this passage, and as this passage actually is being read to him, because insomnia, you know this, when you got insomnia, you're you're uh, not awake enough to read, but you're too tired to sleep. Um, he's having this read to him, and the question, it, it just so happens to come across how Mordecai had spared the life of the king. And he says, what's been done for this guy Mordecai? And they looked at the records and say, wait a minute, nothing's been done for him. Th this, this, is a re this is a reminder how oftentimes... Um, God brings things back into our lives and, and harvests seed we've sown sometimes in a prior season in ways that are completely unexpected. Mordecai has, had been loyal to the king and had told the king of, uh, of this assassination plot. And when Mordecai was expecting a reward, the reward never came. Now, back in this time, you, you, wanted to reward, you wanted to reward faithfulness because by, by punishing uh, disloyalty and by rewarding loyalty, you are incentivizing people to not only be loyal, but to be examples to other people. And so after Mordecai in chapter 2 uncovers this plot, he's expecting his, uh, he's expecting his uh, reward to come. He's, he's, he's waiting at the door waiting for Amazon to show up with his award. 
And day after day, it doesn't come. He's waiting on customer service. It doesn't come. Day after day, his reward never comes. And he begins to feel as if the king has forgotten about him. But I, I want you to know this. The king had. But even when the king forgets about Mordecai, God remembered him. And now five years later, Mordecai is is being rewarded for something that the king has forgotten about, and it's possible even Mordecai forgot about it. That, that, that gives me great hope because it lets me know that, that, that when you and I do the things that we ought to do and say the things that we ought to say and be the people God has called us to be, sometimes we don't get rewarded for it immediately, but eventually it comes back to us later on down the road. It comes back to us when we're, we're uh, finding ourselves in a, in, a, in, a, in a unique circumstance or a unique position, and we just so happen to run into someone that we dealt with kindly years before. It just so happens that all the, all the things in life, sometimes you, you and I can feel that, that God has overlooked us, that God has forgotten us, that God hasn't rewarded us, but here five years later, Mordecai is going to be remembered at the moment it mattered most. When his um, execution was planned for the next day. I want you to know God's people, I want you to know this, that, 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 uh, that oftentimes God moves in our lives in very unexpected, in unexpected timing. The, the, the second way God often uh, moves in our lives is uh, just simply through his sovereignty. A sovereignty simply means that God is in control of all things, or to put it another way, that there is absolutely nothing outside of God's control. Now, now we see this in a couple ways in the passage. The first way that we see it is, is in verse 1. It says, on, the not, on that night the king could not sleep. That sounds uh, very coincidental, but if we read the original Greek translation, the original Greek translation records it this way. It says, the Lord took sleep from the king that night. It wasn't that simply the king couldn't sleep. The reason he could not sleep is the Lord took sleep from him that night. He, he was awake for a reason. He, he wasn't awake because he was remembering all the things that he has done wrong. He wasn't awake because he's thinking about this, this order to exterminate the Jews that, uh, that, he, has, that he has granted, uh, that he's been, been manipulated to grant. He wasn't thinking about those things. The Lord took sleep from him, and, beca and because he couldn't sleep, he said, well, let's read these annuals. He reads the annuals and, or, or has them read to him, and then it just so happens that he comes across this, this account from Mordecai. I mean, think about it. He's got shelves and shelves of books, or rather they had scrolls at the time, but any scroll could have been picked up. It just so happens that the one picked up is the one when he reads or hears the story of his assassination of plot and Mordecai, and, and, and Mordecai was not rewarded. And he says, what, what's been done for this guy? And they say, nothing's been done for this guy. God orchestrated the fact that uh, Mordecai would hear that plot. God orchestrated the fact that Mordecai would not be rewarded at the time. He orchestrated the fact that the Lord took sleep from the king that night. He orchestrated the fact that when, that when he opened up the scroll, or when the scroll was opened up, it just happened to come to the part reminding him of Mordecai's, and Mordecai's um, faithfulness. And this just all happens. This happens the night before Mordecai's execution is planned. It reminds us that God connects the dots so many times when we, when we simply cannot see it. Last Sunday when we were here, we were, we were, we were preaching at, uh, at, uh, at, our, at our 1015 service, and you could hear the wind outside. It almost felt like, like, like the building was being shaken, and actually the building was being shaken. Just enormous, enormous uh, windstorm, and... Uh, 
And, 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 when, and when I went home, I, I went, went the, one, the one road home, but then I had to turn around and go a different way because there was a tree down. There was another place where a tree came down, uh, actually came down in someone's car. And, uh, and when I got uh, on our street, I couldn't, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get to the house because there was a giant, giant uh, limb in the middle of the street that just so happened to come from, from our tree. Now, the storm was, was, was raging, but here's the thing. I never saw the wind. I, I never saw it. I, I looked as close as I could, but I could not see the wind. But I saw the trees down. And I heard the building shaking. And I, and I seen the, the, the trees swaying back and forth. And, and I saw, saw peop, things from people's yards being, being you know, taken perhaps from one yard to... I, 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 wouldn't, I saw all kind of things being moved out of where they were supposed to be because of the wind. You, 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 could, you could see that, but you could not see the wind. That's, um, and you've been there. May, may, not have been, may not have been last week, but, but there have been times I've seen things move from, from one place to the other because the, the, the stretch of the wind. And now he, here's the thing, though. You, you can't see the wind but you know the wind is there because of the effects of the wind on everything else. You know the wind's blowing because the tree's swaying. You know the wind's blowing because the building's shaking. You know the wind's blowing because you're, you're having a hard time keeping the car on the road. You know the wind's blowing because, because there's damage and, 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 and trees down. And in the same sense, you know here that God is moving because you may not see God move, but you see the effects of the move of God. And sometimes in our life we say, you know what? I wish God would speak to me. I wish God were, were, were clear. I, I, I just need some evidence that God has not forgotten about me. And sometimes it's just taking inventory and looking around and noticing that there are all these coincidences that um, it's really the hand of God. He, he, even though you may not see or feel God moving in your life, sometimes we look at what's happening in our life and happening around us, and sometimes we, if we're, if we're, if we're looking closely, we notice that God is orchestrating things that we could never orchestrate or initiate ourselves. God moves in, in sovereign ways. So number one, when we, we see how God preserves his, his people and, um, and, and how he keeps his promises, he does so, uh, he, he does so um, oftentimes in a very delayed way. He does it in unexpected ways, and he also does it in sovereign ways. Um, but he also does it in very ironic ways. God has a great sense of humor. And uh, if you read the book of, of Esther through, you begin to notice the nuances of the humor in the story. When we pick up in verse 4, uh, we, we see how this is uh, played out. Uh, verse 4 says, um, uh, we'll go back to verse 3. The king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The young men who attended him says nothing's been done for him. And the king said, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king. That's an example of the wind moving, of the tree moving. Haman just happens to be there. Um, and uh, the, 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 now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for them, for him. And the king's young men said, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, bring him in. Now, now Haman is there because Haman wants, to, uh, Haman, Haman wants to ask the king for permission to hang Mordecai. He thinks the king's going to rubber stamp this like, like he's rubber stamped everything else. So he goes in. And the king said to him, he asked this question, he says, what should be done to him whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said, basically, oh, 
you know what? He thinks to himself, he doesn't, he's smart enough not to say this out loud, but he says to himself, who on earth would the king want to honor but me? And so what he does is, uh, what, what he does is this. So um, uh, Haman said to himself, whom would the king take delight in more than me? And Haman said to the king, for the man in whom the king delights honors, let's let royal robes be brought. Dress this man in your clothes, he's saying. Um, and, uh, and the horse that the king has ridden and on whose, whose head a royal crown is set. And let the royal robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. He's describing his own job title here. Let them dress the man in whom the king delights to honor and let them lead the horse to the square of the city proclaiming before him. Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. He says this. He said, listen, king, this is what you need to do. You need to dress this guy in your, in your royal clothes and uh, let this guy sit uh, on your royal horse and let him be paraded through your royal city. In other words, he's saying, let this guy dress like the king, ride like the king, and be viewed as the king. In some ways, he's trying to equate himself with the king. Because he's saying, when he's, he's basically saying, let this guy be treated like a king. Haman wants to do it, it, it appears, because Haman doesn't see that much of a distinction between the king and himself. In, in some ways, it could almost, if, if Haman had asked this for himself, it would have been considered treason. Because Haman is basically saying, I'm presenting myself as the king. But Haman is this brilliant guy, so, he's, so he thinks that, uh, that since since we don't know who you're talking about, wink, wink. Uh, let all this be done with the assumption that it's for him. Then, <laughs> then here comes the punchline. Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robes and the horse and do just as you said to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate, leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Can you imagine what's going through Haman's mind at this time? He wakes up. He's going to have the absolute best day ever in his mind. He wakes up. He's going to have dinner. He's scheduled to have dinner with the king and the queen and only the three of them that evening. But he's going to... Uh, plan the execution of his, his enemy Haman. So these, these, um, th these uh, gallows are built 75 feet high. He's coming in. He's asking the king. So this morning, this is going to be Haman's day. He's going to see his, his enemy hung on the gallows. Then he's going to have dinner with the, uh, the king and the queen. And oh yes, he's gotten this treat that he had not expected to be uh, paraded through the city, so he thinks, wearing the king's clothes, riding the king's horse, and being seen as the king. And now all of a sudden, everything he thinks he's going to get is given to the man that he wanted to see executed. His mortal enemy, the guy that he hates the most, is getting the thing that he longed for the most. And it's got to be tearing him up. He's a man that has, he's second in the kingdom, but he is obsessed with the execution of Mordecai because Mordecai won't bow to him. He can't get past it. He thinks he's going to uh, have him executed. And now everything he longed for in life is being given to the man that he hates the most. God has an enormous sense of humor. Now, what we will see is that Mordecai is, uh, 
is treated with all this. It was assumed that Mordecai was going to be executed that day, but now he's being treated as a king. And he's being paraded and given all, all these things. And Mordecai begins to realize that his fate is not what he thought it was. That there is somebody controlling him, outside, uh, something controlling him outside of his own, outside of his own decision. Listen to how the, the, the chapter ends. It said, so Haman took the robes and the horse and he dressed Mordecai. Can you imagine that? He had to dress Mordecai with these clothes that he thought were going to be for him. And he led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man in whom the king delights to honor. And Mordecai goes home. And Look at the conversation when he goes home. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gates, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. When Haman told his wife Zeres and all her friends everything that had happened, then his wise men and his wife Zeres said to him, quote, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him but you will surely fall before him. They're saying to him, you know what, all this that you, you plan, all this that you plan to exterminate the Jews, you plan to execute Mordecai, if, they're saying, if God, and they're not using that phrase, but they're, they're recognizing that um, I, I, they're not attributing it to God, but these counselors and these friends and his wife are recognizing then Mordecai, you may have bit off a bit more than you can chew. And if the people that you plan to exterminate and uh, the man that you tried to execute happen to be of the same people, then there is no way that you're going to stop him or those people. And in fact, you're the one that's going to fall. God has an enormous sense of humor. The things that were planned by Haman to, to, to hurt and to punish and to kill and to execute Mordecai, those things he reaped on himself. And Mordecai received all that he deserved and even more when he thought that he had been forgotten. God, God worked in ways that were unexpected. He worked in ways that were sovereign. He worked in ways that were, that were ironic. And he did so to preserve his people and to, uh, and to keep his promises. And he did so by reversing the roles and the fortunes of these two individuals. And you could say that God was the one that was trading the places with the two. God took the life of Mordecai and, and the, the honor that, uh, the, the, the execution that Mordecai deserved, it looks like Haman may encounter. And the, uh, the, the, the honor that, that Haman was wanting for himself is put on the man that he hated the most. You know, it's one thing for God to be able to trade the spaces of two individuals. I'm sorry, to trade the places. I'm, I'm mixing up my shows. It's one thing for God to trade the places of these two individuals. It's one thing for these two crotchety old men to trade the places of, uh, of Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. But, uh, but, but God does more than just simply trade places in this scenario. God loves us so much that he actually trades places with us in the New Testament. When, when, when you and I have sinned and we deserve to be executed, when we deserve the wrath and the punishment of God, God does not trade our place with someone else. God trades our place with He Himself. And Jesus comes in the, 
God comes in the person of Jesus Christ. He takes upon us our sin. He takes upon us our guilt, our iniquity, and he dies in our place so that we could receive the things that we don't deserve, which is life eternally with Christ because we've been forgiven. God traded places with us. And when he traded places with us, the Father treated Jesus the Son as if he were a sinner so that he could treat you or I as if we were a child of God. And I'm so thankful for it. God preserves his people and he keeps his promises in ways uh, oftentimes that, uh, that are unexpected, that are sovereign, that are somewhat ironic. And he does so the most through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. In terms of irony, God killed death by dying. Rising from the dead. Father, I thank you that you did not leave us where we were, but rather you traded places with us in the person of Jesus. And because of his sinless life and his death and his resurrection, that when and if we put our hope in him, that we likewise can trade places in that we can eternally be a child of you and and live with you forever. Father, we love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, who, who traded places for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, I'm so thankful that you chose to be with us and worship with us this morning. I'm so grateful that you've... Uh, that you've been part of this series, and uh, I hope you're enjoying it. We're certainly enjoying it here uh, at Hope Church. Just want to remind you, want you to stay home and stay safe and uh, stay sane, of course. Uh, just continue to worship with us online, and uh, if there's anything we can do for you, please reach out to us. Uh, you, can, you can reach out to me at uh, jason at hopeanddayton.org. You can find our website by, uh, by going to www.hopeanddayton.org. While you're there, you can, um, you can give of your tithes and offerings. Uh, if you want to give through, uh, through our Text to Give app, you can do that. Uh, and then also, you can, of course, you can mail your cash or checks to uh, our Wilmington Pike location uh, that you see on the screen at this time. Uh, during this month, uh, we are um, ha- taking a special offering for those uh, in our church family that have been impacted by the, uh, by the COVID virus, those that have been sick for a while and those who... Um, who COVID has disrupted their life because of, uh, because of job situations and, and layoffs and those kind of things. Um, but uh, we, want be a, we, want to, um, we want to be a blessing to those families. So uh, if you'd like to uh, give to that especially, uh, just uh, write on your check um, COVID relief or yeah, just write on your check COVID and, uh, and, and send it to us. Uh, or also if you give electronically through our website or through our text to give, uh, there should be um, a designation that says COVID Relief Fund. Uh, every dime that comes into that fund will directly go to families uh, in this congregation that have been impacted by the, uh, by, the COVID, uh, by the COVID virus in one way or the other. So, hey, this is Thanksgiving week. Hope you uh, enjoy your holiday with your, immediately, with your immediate family. I hope you stay safe. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you, but I'd much rather have you safe than, uh, than uh, have you infected. So just continue to be safe. Uh, we'll see you soon. God bless, and uh, have a great Thanksgiving. God bless you. We'll see you, we'll see you next week. <laughs>